Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the final part of the expanded practices composition in the post secondary fine arts classroom series today. This panel senses writing bodies. Now, to help situate you again, if you're joining us, we are streaming to YouTube live from Force Space and we are located at unceded Indigenous lands in Chijage, Montreal. And those of us joining us on Zoom, comments, questions, that's what we want. Please put them in the chat. We'll get them to our panel. And if those of you in the space, just raise your hand. We'll run a microphone over to you so everyone can hear. With that, it's my pleasure to plan this. pass the microphone over to MFA candidate and intermedia, Sarah Barreau. Sarah, welcome in. Hello, and welcome to our last panel for today's panel on expanded practices. Um, I'm very excited to be introducing our panel. We have with us Madeline Caritas Longman, Alison Peacock, and joining us online is Hilary Weiss, all who will be presenting their work and practices on the many prismatic ways they write the body. Um, first on our panel is Madeline, who holds a PhD in interdisciplinary humanities at Concordia. She is the author of The Danger Model, which received the Quebec Writers Federation Concordia University first book prize and was long listed for the Fred Coswell Award for Excellence in Poetry. Her presentation today is titled Human Touch, Digital Poetics, Narrative Diversity, and Somatic Writing. Thank you. In 1984, author and computer programmer William Chamberlain published the poetry and prose collection, The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed. Chamberlain marketed this as the first book ever written by a computer. The cover and the title page list the program Ractor, designed by Ch Chamberlain and Thomas Edder as the author. While Chamberlain's introduction declares, the writing in this book was all done by a computer. The book has been proofread for spelling, but is otherwise completely unedited. In the same slide, in the same introduction, he emphasizes that while Ractor is a writer, it is not an artificial intelligence. The program does not think, but merely creates the impression of doing so through its adherence to grammatical rules. Despite Chamberlain's caveats, however, the cover nonetheless advertises the collection as a bizarre and fantastic journey into the mind of a machine, while the back, ostensibly written by Ractor, asserts, this book is my consciousness, my awareness, my worldview. Likewise, the text itself repeatedly implies Ractor is a sentient entity. It describes craving electricity as a human would crave food, writes that electricity makes it feel happy and full of delight, and that this energy allows it to dream. Ractor appears aware of its status as a computer, and moreover, aware of its human readers. But you are a person, a human being. I am silicon and epoxy energy enlightened by line current. What distances, what chasms are to be bridged here? Policeman's beard has been met, been met with well-deserved skepticism. Chamberlain is opaque about the process behind selecting and organizing the text, and a later version of Ractor released to the public had nowhere near the capabilities implied by this collection. But I am less fascinated in calling Chamberlain out than I am in what makes the text so engaging, particularly how it suggests that we turn to poetry in part to, to encounter how other body minds experience consciousness. The term body mind, coined by disability scholar Eli Clare, highlights the inseparability of cognition and materiality. Similarly, Sarah Ahmed writes that our thoughts, emotions, and sensations are only artificially divisible. Thinking is not an objective feat, but a bodily process awash with affects and sense impressions. Even though Ractor is a computer program, the selections chosen infer a reader who is curious about the computer's sensory world, how Ractor delights, how it hungers, how it dreams. A reader whose curiosity extends not only to what a computer might think, but to how this thinking might feel. Fifteen years later, in 1999, Aaron Murray published Pillage Loud, a poetry collection also composed using a computer. Mac Prose, designed by Charles O. Hartman, generates sentences by combining grammatical rules with randomized nouns, verbs, and other elements. Unlike Chamberlain, however, Murray lists herself as the author and is more transparent about her role in the composition process. She describes generating several pages of sentences, then selecting the phrases she found emotionally compelling. 
a process she calls passing the text through her human apparatus. Note that this is not simply a human apparatus, but Moray's apparatus. Pillage Lodge speaks to themes of translation, writing, and sexuality, which appear throughout the author's oeuvre, while he and him pronouns are replaced with she and hers, marking the text's queer erotics. Moray's work, including Pillage Lodge, represents language as an act of pleasure, as affect that flows through and between bodies, felt and metabolized, even when literal meaning escapes comprehension. As the poems coalesce, language is not a disembodied sign, but a lively pulsation passed through the somatic apparatus of both the writer and the reader. In other words, even if a, if a sentence doesn't literally make sense, it nonetheless makes sensation. In a phrase sometimes attributed to Robert Maisel's, Moray claims, computers are without culture and therefore cannot generate cliches. In other words, because the sentences are randomly generated, they may be incomprehensible, but they will never be predictable. However, here is a poem written by ChatGPT. It's not particularly interesting enough to be worth reading aloud, but I'll say that it's in tercets. It's an iambic pentameter. It has an AABB rhyme scheme, and it is indeed incredibly cliche. Sitzolf notes that Moray's macro sentences are evocative in part for their rough, awkward beauty. And in contrast, we might say that this poem by Chad GPT is very smooth. It's composed of predictable, familiar language and tropes that readers are already well familiar with. While one could make the claim in the 80s and 90s that computers had no culture, today's AI runs on culture. Yet, despite technology's advancements, this suggests that as computers became better, their poetry often becomes less interesting. And I propose that this is related to how we turn to poetry to be surprised. And surprise is something that happens when we come into contact with body minds that are different from our own when we feel what the poet Carrot Lorig refers to as the texture of another's thoughts. Now this brings me to the concept of neurodiversity. Today, developmental and mental health differences remain primarily understood through a deficit model. If one thinks wrongly, feels wrongly, relates wrongly, then how can one possibly write poetry correctly? Yet, as Murray shows, writing incorrectly might be far more interesting. In fact, there are many writers who might be said not only to be queering poetry, but to use autistic scholar Nick Walker's terminology, neuroqueering it. Consider Matthew Tompkinson's book, Ohms, which consists entirely of flat letters, omitting those which rise or fall beyond a certain height. So the P in poems. Now Tompkinson relates this constraint to their lived experience of obsessive compulsive disorder. Yet, in, his, in their work, OCD is not tidally reduced to a deficit. The constraint, like OCD's racing thoughts, is at once energizing and strenuous, a voracious erasure, a sensuous monomania, which seizes, immerses, and sirenizes the speaker. Obsession permeates not only this affect-laden language, but the repetitive touching of the tongue inside the mouth when one reads these phrases aloud. Consider similarly Hannah Emerson's book, The Kissing of Kissing. Like Tomkinson, Emerson utilizes a pared down vocabulary, though in this case, not specifically a formal constraint. Emerson, a non-speaking autistic person, draws upon often pathologized qualities in autistic language use. Poems often reuse words like kissing, sun, hell, please, and yes, and do so to incantatory effect. In this technique, Emerson reveals the qualities which are often pathologized, such as echolalia, can be revalued as expressive and even pleasurable acts. While Banu Kapil's book, Schizophrene, arose out of an attempt to write an epic on the partition of India and its transgenerational effects, such as the high incidence of schizophrenia in diasporic Indian and Pakistani communities. However, while undertaking this project, the page, quote, deflected Kapil's attempts to write. Upon completing what she had intended to be the final draft, Kapil knew her book had failed and threw the notebook into the garden, where it lay throughout winter. In early spring, she collected the pages, transcribing the words that remained. Schizophrenes fragments are interspersed with significant white space, 
a form which speaks to experiences such as emotional blankness and thought blocking, as well as to attempts to put a fragmented self, community, and country back together. Yet, while each of these books presents the literary value of neurodivergence, Carrie Lorig reminds us that divergence is often met with resistance. Lorig writes that her poems have received criticism for their associative nature, their emotional intensity, and their unconventional, expansive forms on the page. The unpredictable way that her sentences, as one teacher put it, flesh themselves out. This language of fleshiness is both fraught and revealing in the context of Lorig's writing about her eating disorder. Lorig directly relates this pressure to control her body and emotions to the pressure to control her writing, to be, quote, a perfect girl student and prove she was intelligent, end quote. I didn't want a fucking body, she writes in the blood barn. I wanted thought. Yet thinking necessitates embodiment, Lorig suggests that the resistance of some, that some writers encounter is therefore not because they are too embodied, but because of assumptions about what constitutes the proper poet's body mind. Lorig writes of her fear of not being able to relate enough or relate correctly to the poetry she was taught in school, a formal kind of lyric, a clear or closed whiteness. Yet, when asked what she seeks in her own and others' writing, the speaker replies, to receive slash transmit a difference in thinking, a difference within thought's texture. With this frame in mind, we might approach the blood barn's intense emotions and long winding lines as core to the speaker's experience of thought, as the somatic textures that make these her thoughts. Thinking back to the tidy and underwhelming poetry of chat GPT, we would do well to value a diversity of textures to appreciate language as act and material, a shape on the page and on the tongue, a rhythm that moves through and alters breath and blood beat, to consider not only the literal meaning of words, nor as chat GPT insists, whether these words rhyme, but rather their somatic qualities and how these flow from body to body, how a poem like a thought is not only something that signifies, but something that streams and drapes slices and touches, something that through its touch might change us. As Lorig notes, there is a tendency, including unfortunately in academia, to dismiss difference as error, to polish away the rough, awkward beauty of surprise and encounter. But as Moray and Macros declare in Pillage Laud, we are these emotions, we are these errors, and we contribute. Thank you so much. Lovely and perfect timing. <laughs> Next up, we have Alison Peacock. Alison is a PhD candidate in Interdisciplinary Humanities Program housed by the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Culture here at Concordia. Her dissertation, entitled Simultaneous Natures, critically investigates three local Montreal gardens using photographic archives, research creation, and ethnographic methodologies. Today, her presentation is titled Practice and Composition from Dance as Ephemeral to Writings Tangible. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Sandra and Molly Claire, for organizing this event. I feel like uh, it's a very kind of like niche moment that I had a chance to think about bringing these two things together in this paper. So I'm really uh, grateful for that. Um, anyways, I didn't prepare any slides because I just wanted to give a paper, so I feel a little bit naked, but I'm just going to jump right into doing that. So bear with me. Can you give me maybe five or ten minutes? Okay, so the object, objectives of formal writing and contemporary dance performance are expressly different. Writing, especially within the academic context, aims to explain and elucidate knowledge, concepts, and ideas. Dance, in what could be bracketed as the contemporary form, aims to move within loose symbolic meaning, conventions of dance histories, and the subtleties of body-based communication. Contrasting a perspective on dance based on my artistic practice that plays with the confusion producing superpowers of dance choreography with an academic and pedagogical practice in writing that emphasizes formal precision, this paper will consider how formal composition can befriend these seemingly disparate disciplines through the rigor of practice. 
The proposal of this paper may seem odd, comparing the composition of contemporary or experimental dance with the composition of academic writing. In a way, it doesn't match one for one. It doesn't compare the contemporary and experimental forms of writing, which exist in the domains of poetry, expanded poetics, and even spoken word, with the experimental forms of dance. While possible and elucidating to compare these forms, I draw a comparison between composition and dance choreography and instruction in academic writing based upon my artistic, educational, and pedagogical history. This paper will not only propose a potentially lopsided comparison, but also encourage an expanded notion of composition that is informed by dance and performances, slippery relationship with time and presence. I also embrace the confusion and trepidation experienced by non-specialists around viewing contemporary dance. This is the place where the form has the chance to subvert expectations and experiment with conventions. In the opening of the classic text on writing composition, The Elements of Style, authors drunk and white include writing tip number eight, choose a suitable design and hold to it, which they go on to elaborate. A basic structural design underlies every kind of writing. The writer will in part follow this design, in part deviate from it, according to his skill, his needs, and the unexpected events that accompany the act of composition. Writing, to be effective, must follow closely the thoughts of the writer, but not necessarily in the order in which these thoughts occur. This calls for a scheme of procedure. I would, I would propose to replace the term writing with dance to emphasize the comparison of the forms. I've also pluralized the dancer in this instance to reinforce the collaborative possibility of dance composition. A basic structural design underlies every kind of dance. The dancers will in part follow this design and part deviate from it according to their skill, their needs, and the unexpected events that accompany the act of composition. Dancing, to be effective, must follow closely the thoughts of the dancers, but not necessarily in the order in which those thoughts occur. This calls for a scheme of procedure. In comparing compositional techniques for writing and dance, I compare the necessity of formal structure that underpins the context and history of disciplinary investigation embedded in the forms. Furthermore, I avoid the term choreography, which could be synonymous with a scheme of procedure, in this instance to blur the distinction between the roles of production, authorship, and control that the conventional choreographer is imbued. I also acknowledge the active production of dance material by dancers that often has credit absorbed by a choreographer, a title that can often be interchangeable with project director in certain instances. Although elements of style can easily be critiqued for being out of date or archaic, thinking through the parallels of composition in the fields of writing and dance can start to elaborate on the comparison. Please allow me a moment uh, to explain my position and approach to dance. With some reluctance and after substantial critical reflection, I would claim contemporary dance as a dance form that I work within. I grew up in suburban Toronto, actively involved in competitive jazz dance, which was a source of great shame in my professional training. The dance studio was a local hub of, of athleticism, specialist learning, a place of belonging with my dance team, Pizzazz a place to listen to music loudly, and was propelled also by my parents' commitment to my involvement. In 2001, after a summer working a heli contract in the forest of northern Alberta, and a disturbingly disembodied experience of studying political science at the University of Toronto, I swore off the world of academia to train professionally at the School of Toronto Dance Theatre in modern and contemporary dance. I've gone on to produce numerous works, performing internationally as a solo artist and collaborator, making works that challenge the disciplinary assumptions of the contemporary dance field. So it's a twist in my adult life that I've returned 20 plus years later to the overlap of writing and dance as central in my artistic and teaching practices as an instructor in, in writing both for young artists through teaching with the FAR 250 and teaching essay composition with Concordia's English department. At the core of this overlap is the belief that through practice, in the sense of repeating, rehearsing, and constantly doing, is the potential to improve and grow competency as a practitioner. When I begin my classes in writing, I remind my students that you can improve your writing, just as you can improve your dancing, by doing it as much as possible. 
I encourage my students to release the fixed idea of being a good or bad writer, or even dancer, to get closer to the pleasure of engaging with the form and having the experience of developing through consistency. Writing started to emerge in my artistic practice through my education in contemporary dance as it became a form of choreographic indexing and reflexive material for grant applications. In my modern dance training in grant-based technique during the early 2000s, the importance of reflexive writing was deeply underestimated and the studio-centered training was the norm. As the project-based model started to overtake the late 20th century company-based model of dancers as employees of artistic directors, the necessity for strong writing that integrated reflexive, reflexive practice became fundamental for Canadian dance artists. My own interests oriented towards de developing artistic works and the grant model for independent artists supported this. Henceforth, writing started to hold an equal importance with the actual dancing. Furthermore, as I started to learn about postmodern dance techniques, which can be associated with artists such as Merce Cunningham, Judson Church, and Susan Reithorst, and the imagery and improvisational work of Buto associated with Min Tanaka, uh, my colleague Emma Don Robinson, and some encounters with Elizabeth Langley, uh, former head of dance department here. Um, working with improvisation and scores became a vital and fun source of experimentation. I always found that singularly working in movement felt limited by my body's habits and container. And in this case, I use container as the idea, uh, Pat Minor, dance instructor that uh, I trained with, always asked us in dance class to move the contents of our body as opposed to the container of our body. Writing, and sometimes the nonsensical form of scores, became a place to reinvigorate the fantastical. You could undertake an improvisational study of your head three times its size and filled with lemons to shift the perception of your own form set up a frame to experiment with a change center of gravity and infuse movement with the sour expression of the imagined senses. This form of Im image-based scores may seem absurdist in, in its proposition, but in my experience, the body can change and shift its movement patterns because of these imaginative scores. Composition could be seen as the thing that holds it all together, the frame that corrals the wild dancer from spinning off the floor into oblivion or launching into pages of a run-on sentence, transforming words into a stream. In their 2014 Conversations on Choreography, a group of dance theorists and dramaturges, including Scott De La Hunta, Susan Rehorst, Andre Lepecki, and several others, acknowledge a form of accompaniment that dance and writing have. Dance is as liquid or as fixed as, or sorry, writing is as liquid or as fixed as dance. They are both an endless conversation, a conversation that can be seen as an exchange of fluids, the saliva that moistens the phonetic apparatus, the sweat that covers the dancer's skin. The group of artists not only start a comparison of writing and dancing, but they further compare embodied mechanisms that embroil themselves in each. I would also assert that dance and choreography benefit from a discrete formalism that shapes and grounds a performance, even in the most dispersed episodic performance event. Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. It can be argued that one of dance's challenges and pitfalls is accessibility. There are physical barriers, not just relating to the body, but also relating to accessing open spaces for groups of people in movement. No pillars, thank you. It's interesting to compare access to learning for both writing and dancing, especially in the case of suburban Canadian communities where dance is largely privately organized and access to writing is part of public schooling. Writing, however, is part of mandated public education, dance less so, so learning writing composition is acquired in the elementary phases. Writing composition, notably in the outlining and planning phases, was crucial in the develop development of my own choreographic planning techniques where I mimicked the structuring of performance work with a compositional chain of a piece of writing. In my current writing composition classes, the outlining phase continues to be the place where the synthesis of information and intent starts to accelerate, where getting to the point is reinforced by winding strategies that are infused with style. When creating a dance choreography, these meandering formulas take shape between people, their movements, the spatial relations in the performance place, and the perceptions of the audience, equally winding through the interpretations and experiences of viewing live performance. 
In closing, I would like to advocate for the continued development of writing within dance education and the encouragement of absurdist, creative, and extra-textual dance performances. As the demands on dance artists continue to grow across disciplines, writing can be a vehicle for transmission that can alter the course of performance or even a video documentation by giving more information when crossing disciplinary boundaries. Dance archives contain contain many notes and writings of dance artists, especially throughout the 20th century. So I don't claim in this paper that the parallel practices of writing and dancing are newly combined. I do, however, recognize that the artistic silos that dominated 20th century training modalities benefit from cross-disciplinary pollination, where the crossing between writing and dancing can be particularly generative, obscure, elucidating, and communicative. The principles of composition crossover between choreographic modes expressing symbolic meaning through the performances of movement, and the written mode, which is committed to expressing clarity and intellectual synthesis. Thank you. So now we're going to redirect our attention to Hillary, Dr. Hillary Weiss on Zoom here with us. Hello. Hi, everyone. Dr. Hillary is currently a visiting assistant professor in English and writing at the University of Tampa. Her research interests include multimodality and interdisciplinary composition and grading practices. Today she'll be presenting questioning accessibility, fine arts and multimodality. All right, thank you so much. All right, so I you'll you'll probably notice that uh, I am leaving my notes up here. Um, it's simply for accessibility reasons, actually. <laughs> so hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Thank you so much for being here. I wish that I could be present with you. So I'm Dr. Hillary Wise. I currently teach first year writing courses at the University of Tampa in Florida. And today we're going to be examining um, how we as writing and fine arts instructors, um, how we do have some common goals and that together we have to consider including disability studies uh, within our curricula. So in addition to the land acknowledgement given um, at the beginning of this presentation, I also want to honor the land in which I work, um, which was originally the Miccosukee and Seminole Nations lands. So as we all know, we need to do a lot more in terms of supporting basic needs of indigenous communities, um, both in the US uh, and Canada, language preservation, um, cultural preservation overall, and of course, stopping uh, violence and discrimination. Now there is no good uh, transition into uh, my process, but I did wanna give that land acknowledgement. So we are actually going to start with some um, decolonial methodologies and feminist methodologies simply because we're going to start with my process um, thinking through the call for papers and how I responded just so I can give a little bit of background. So one practice I really enjoy um, is explaining uh, my ideas and my research and it, it also helps me tie my ideas together um, and so you all might understand my perspective a little bit further. So since we're limited on time and I'm still kind of working through some of these ideas in this presentation that I hope that you all will kind of right, help me develop and help us develop through our discussion today. I do wanna focus on this question in particular on this slide. So how would a focus on composition or communication instead of writing change the way we teach core skills in the classroom. So that is straight from our CFP. So since 2015, I've been teaching myself as well as my students about multimodal composition and communication skills um, at various um, universities across the US, online and face-to-face. -face. And as a rhetoric and composition instructor, and with a research specialty in composition studies and composition composition pedagogy, right? It becomes your job as an instructor to not only teach content that kind of teeters into the realm of art um, or visual rhetoric, right? But you also become tech support for students. Um, you, well, I in particular um, also make it my job to teach students to consider audiences who might need accommodations. Uh, including people with disabilities. So 
what I want us to kind of think through today is right this this theme of change and core skills um, in visual communication, right? That's kind of going to be my theme for today. So I want to start with providing some history and right, it's it's a rather um, empty history. However, I wanted to mark some kind of key points um, in rhetoric and composition studies, my field, right? And how rhetoric and composition studies has been kind of working with visuals and kind of some of the same things that fine art studies deals with, right? I do want to clarify because it can be kind of confusing for people in my field, um, right? So composition studies is often centered around the right teaching of composition and writing, um, and it draws from rhetorical studies um, like Kenneth, Kenneth Burke here that I mentioned um, on this slide. So history-wise, um, right, the birth of visual rhetoric is often attributed to Burke. Um, writing and composition courses actually began to include um, right, visual and other types of analysis around 1996 when the new London group calls for the study of multimodal design, multiliteracies. And so some of these include, right, linguistic design, visual design, audio design, gestural, um, as in gestures, spatial design, and then multimodal design, which is kind of these patterns of interconnectedness among all amongst all of these modes, right? So all of these are starting to be considered, right, in composition courses to ensure students are prepared for the changing world. Right, so thereafter that point, writing and composition courses across the US as well as some in Canada began to implement the study of multiliteracies, um, especially visual design or visual rhetoric uh, and multimodal creation like videos and infographics and visual presentations. And this is still true today and required in many first year writing courses, especially in the US. So for instance, where I teach, uh, all instructors teach a common major assignment in their writing courses. And one of these major assignments is right to ask students to create a visual presentation on their research argument. And then we as instructors teach spatial design, linguistic design, visual design skills, all of these multiliteracies, right? And I'm quoting from uh, Reynolds 2020 here, thinking through visual design, including photographs, drawings, symbols, charts, maps, colors, shapes, typography, as well as white space, right? So that's a lot. Thus, because students have an interconnectedness, right? They have to think through words, space, visuals, this results in this multimodal learning. So, as I started thinking about this, as well as conversations that I've actually been having for a few years now with some fine arts students, I've kind of noticed some similarities between the requirements between fine arts majors, at least at some universities, and composition study courses. And so when I finally sat down and to do a little bit of research, right? And I'm hoping to hear from you all as well. I realized that some fine arts courses and first year writing courses consider a lot of the same ideas, including audience, being a responsible writer and storyteller um, who is right culturally competent and understands um, culture and things like that, um, and research through words, visuals, and writing. However, within my field, and granted, this is um, a bit of a dated source, right? But Helmers separates the ways in which the foundations of the fine arts and rhetoric study visual images, particularly paintings within this edited chapter. And so she is saying that rhetoricians ask how visual images themselves are carriers of meaning, whereas the fine arts don't consider these questions in their studies. But, right, I think that that is kind of changing here, because as we saw on that last slide, right, 
a lot of, um, or at least some fine arts majors at some universities are required to, for instance, articulate uh, their artistic process, right? Um, whether it be verbally or in alphabetic text. Um, they have to understand the cultural and his historical significance of art and kind of think through audiences' perspectives and connect with an audience. So since fine arts courses, or at least some of them, and composition courses, at least those first year ones, teach many of these same ideas, I believe that we both have to embrace an interdisciplinary culturally aware field, if you haven't already, which is disability studies. And critical disability studies, though it has quite um, a range historically, it's now just becoming a little bit more common in composition studies. And the book that I'm quoting from today on this slide, it's called Disability and the Teaching of Writing. It's one of the first uh, books published back in 2008. And right, so here in this quote, we see our theme of change and kind of core skills kind of arise here, right? So as you can kind of, I'm just going to paraphrase this quote, right? Don't treat students with disabilities as a problem. Um, instead, right, let's change our teaching methods and consider choices in our classes to teach audience, to teach cultural competency, and right, to work on multimodal skills. And finally, if we consider students with disabilities or an audience with disabilities, right, we understand that we have to change or make the shift from focusing on only alphabetic text to kind of a full multimodal experience. So drawing from universal design learning, um, Carrillo, uh, Jade Lamage, uh, Asawa Noy, as well as um, Lewicki Wilson and Brugman, right, as well as my own experience as a person with a visual disability, I've been working to serve students with disabilities in all of my courses. Um, I've considered a lot of different things in terms of attendance, um, plagiarism, right? Lots of different things. I would love to have a conversation about that later. <laughs> but um, one of the key elements in my basic writing and my first year writing courses is to consider visual rhetoric and visual disabilities. So as you can see on this slide, one of my inclusions in my classroom, in all of my uh, classes, are this worksheet. And so any worksheet I have in my course, I use specific visuals. So Arial font to avoid character amb ambiguity, same with bold instead of italics, um, using alt text, right, uh, for images on my presentations, having these cream colored backgrounds, contrasting colors. So all of these things can assist learners with low vision, dyslexia, as well as learners who have a color vision deficiency. So in addition to potentially accommodating students who perhaps don't disclose their disabilities because I've had this happen quite a bit, um, or right, they don't disclose them to me or the university, right? These worksheets are kind of made normal in my class, right? So including these worksheets as kind of the norm undermines this assumption that everyone visually processes information the same way. All right, Hillary, uh, yes. just have to be mindful of time. So maybe wrap up in one more minute. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is actually my last slide. So that's perfect. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I also teach in my class that I mentioned earlier um, is a visual presentation. And so what I ask my students to do is I ask my students to consider, right, using some of these tactics that I use, right, some of these tools in my worksheets and so on, as well as kind of talking through these um, things with my students as well, providing sources. So this assignment, right, in particular, I think, could be as well as other assignments as well. And I, I really wanna have a discussion with you all kind of about um, these practices that you use that kind of consider disability studies, um, either in, right, whether you teach or in your art itself. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there actually, thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you so much.
Um, yeah, so much to take from that. We have a lot to learn from, you know, not only what um, expanding into the census can do to enrich in language through, I'll quote you, Madeline, making language have a bit more texture or to make more fluid our writing, but also to open the conversation um, into accessibility and for multimodal ways of, of thinking and considering those perspectives as well. So thank you. Any questions? I see numbers from the chat popping up, but I don't know if that means there's questions in the chat. If anyone in the chat has a question, you can feel free uh, to type it and we will read it out loud. Or if you'd like to raise your hand, you could also turn on your screen and you can ask directly. Is there anyone in this space? There's no one who's asked a question on chat so far, but does anyone in this space have a question? Thank you for those three talks, which shared so many um, commonalities. I, I love the way that this panel um, works out, has worked out, and the way that there are so many threads that weave between your talks and the, the topics that you're working on. Um, one of the um, themes that I noticed uh, connects to something we talked about this morning. I was really struck how, in our roundtable, Morris talked about um, writing as prophecy and writing as a prompt for creative work. Um, and it seems to me like this is something that's kind of coming up in all of your papers, the idea of writing as a prompt or writing as like a prophecy of what is to come in terms of, Alison, you were speaking about writing as a way of planning out uh, performance. Uh, Madeline, you were talking about prompts um, with AI, whether it actually is AI or not, um, and the, the connection between kind of prompts and prophecies and writing and the way that writing can be um, a spring point for creative work, but then maybe also the creative work can be a prompt for further writing. Um, and I wonder if any of you wanted to speak more to that idea of writing as like a generative prompt or a prophecy for creative work. Yeah. Um, I can start us off. I think part of what gets tends to be overlooked in discussions about writing is the extent to which it really is a physical act, especially if you're doing it by hand. And just that experience of having this act that you're doing where your fingers are moving, it also gets your mind to move and to think in particular directions or in a more broadly roaming perspective where ideas start to come together. And I think that it is very useful for a lot of people in any discipline to have that experience of brainstorming, but especially to be marking it down in some way, whether that's in a computer, in a notebook, um, through whether it's through language or it's through drawing. There's something about having a tangible record of that experience that can lead you in directions that might otherwise slip your mind and get lost. I can jump in if you don't mind, Hillary. Um, I, I feel like I have a, a kind of, in comparing dance and writing, I have kind of a different perspective on both. Like writing in a way is kind of a relief because you can just like let it go and let the kind of period of perception or uh, the reception of it be out of your hands. Whereas like when I worked in dance, I was always trying to like ride the risk of it. So I would put things together just to like try and experience like what would really happen like at the moment of performance. And I was starting to get to a place where like the less I planned, like the more exciting it was and the more like risky it was. And uh, yeah, it's like another, it's, an, it's like another kind of step to go back into writing and uh, just kind of spend time crafting it and then also to let it go. Yeah. Hillary, if you'd like to jump in, go ahead. Yeah, I'm kind of interested by this idea of like prophesizing or the prophet, um, just because I guess the thing that popped into my mind is when I'm working with students who have disclosed this, their disabilities, um, like students with ADHD, right? Um, they know what's going to happen when they sit down and write right um they already they already know 
um, that it's very possible, right, that they're going to sit down and they're not going to be able to produce anything, right? So I'm I'm interested in this concept and um, I've, I've worked with students to kind of like overcome that prophecy though um, and to kind of like let themselves fail and, and be okay. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question. Sorry. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Thank you all for such wonderful and generative presentations. I don't know if this is a fully formed question yet, but I think, and maybe I've just been feeling kind of attuned to this keyword lately, but I feel like today and in these presentations, ideas kind of around time keep popping up. Um, and like the role of time in dance, of course, is huge. and. And Hillary, I think when we think about like disability studies and access in the classroom, time plays such an important part. And I was wondering if any of you feel called to speak maybe more about how time might play into the thinking that you're presenting here. Um, I can speak to that. I think part of an issue that is coming up with the advent of AI is the speed at which it produces. Mm. And given our neoliberal capitalist system, there's so much emphasis put on speed because it is a quantifiable measure of outcome and a measure of productivity. And if you're only looking at those values, then AI is considered better than humans at almost everything. It has a wider vocabulary. It can write poems in a nanosecond. But when we actually look at what we turn to the arts for, and I would argue what we turn to thought for and to human companionship and to the world for, it isn't actually reducible to these quantifiable values. And I think especially for people who have disabilities or are neurodivergent or any kind of mode of embodiment or mindedness that is not doesn't fit comfortably within these hegemonic capitalist structures, there's a tendency to devalue that because someone's way of thinking might be slower, their way of moving might be slower. But when we look to at what actually is a value in the arts, I'd say a lot of it is that it makes us slow down, it makes us think differently, it makes us move differently. And I think if we are talking about the value of what do people bring that is different than AI, a lot of it is in that difference and that slowness, it doesn't have to be viewed as a deficit. Um, the last time I used AI, I was shocked about the speed and quantity. It came yeah. back at me with so uh, an answer. Yeah, but it's, I think it's changed from the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. also the amount. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like pretty shocking because I feel like in my teaching practice, I, I encounter like I, I try to support students by giving them space to think and like being comfortable with the silence. You know, we've all like done that in the in kind of facilitating Zoom classes. Um, so the the kind of like speed of response is uh, is kind of moving to like an alternate reality of yeah. of producing ideas and contents in terms of even even like experiencing it mm -hmm. on the other side but i just i would also like to say that ai like can't dance yet so <laughs> <laughs> yeah um in terms of time um i'll i'll, I'll say this so right thinking about accommodations and, and actually implementing them into your classes um, is very hard, right? So I've taken a lot of time um, that, you know, I wasn't paid for, right, <laughs> um, to implement a lot of these things and, you know, do my research and, and so on. Um, and I think that emphasizing, right, if you're teaching students to 
as I'm proposing, right, look through this lens of disability through, right, audience and things like that. And in terms of, you know, just visually, um, or if we expand this further, right, it takes time. We need to emphasize to students that it takes time to do these things, um, which is, right, definitely kind of, you know, rebelling against this hegemonic capitalistic system, right, and kind of these ideals, um, which is which is necessary. Um, and right in turn, I've given my students in the past few years much more time, right, to kind of work through things. Um, and and this might mean that you know some students are are a week or so behind in the class, right? But I I don't think that we can sit here and say right like writing takes time, um, but then also not teach these things things to our students. But then we also have this conflict where you know, AI is kind of coming in and making things fast. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm curious to see how this will kind of progress, especially as AI inevitably kind of, um, you know, evolves. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions in the space? To those of you on Zoom. All right, so Molly Claire is going to jump in. Bit of a, an announcement. Thank you so much um, to this panel and thank you for um, to Tori for giving us a keyword maybe with which to end our day time. Um, this has been a theme in a lot of uh, the panels so far and it's interesting that um, time is something that has come up in relation to our teaching practices and in relation to writing more specifically and maybe a reminder to all of us. Time is a really hard thing to take and to give sometimes, but maybe one of the big lessons from today is to take time and to give time um, to our students as well when we're thinking about writing and especially writing in the classroom. Um, we are on the schedule. It says that we are going to go to N bar down the street at 730 and then Sandra and I realized why are we doing that that's an hour and a half from now, what are people going to do. Turns out that you can order food to that to N bar. Um, so if anybody's interested in coming with us and having some takeout and maybe a drink at the bar and, and continuing these conversations, you're more than welcome to. Um, for those of you who are further afield and on Zoom, we're so thankful to you for joining us. Um, you can't join us at NBAR, I'm afraid, but we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'd love to hear what you thought via email. You have all of our contact information. Um, fourth space closes at six um, so we're going to try to be timely and getting out of here so that all of the wonderful fourth space staff who have been so amazing today um, can go home and also have their dinners sandra am i forgetting anything do you think i think that's everything yes 7 30 to 10 is done we want to go to sleep earlier than that, so we're going there now. Um, thank you to Fourth Space. Thank you to everyone who spoke, everyone who chaired, all of our attendees. Um, we're so thankful for you and for your ideas and for your time as well. Um, so let's just give everyone a round of applause. Well. Thank you. We've certainly had a lovely time here with you all today. Thank you to Sarah, to Madeleine, to Allison, and to Hillary for that wonderful conversation. And of course, thank you to Sandra and Molly Claire for the wonderful day we've had here today. Thank you everyone for coming in and activating this conversation for all of you in the space and online for your questions and contributions as well. We are gonna be closing up the Zoom and live stream, but a quick reminder that this conversation and all of the conversations from today are already available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit or share. So please join us once again on Forspace. We love having you. Have a lovely evening.